Glasses up. Cheers. Cheers. Hey everybody, we are back today. We are drinking Monarch of the Glen. This is a blended scotch that's, I think, 12 years of blending. Mm -hmm. uh, what is this? Monarch of the Glen. Monarch of the Glen. The, the guy on my local Total Wine, I said, like, hey man, I like 20 bucks. I filmed this kind of crappy podcast with two other guys. What, what can I get that will fool them into thinking this might be good quality alcohol? And he says, Monarch of the Glen is some of the finest blended scotch you can buy. What, what do you guys think? I like it. I think it's tasty. Uh, it's smooth. I'm a scotch fan. Mm -hmm. um, I would definitely, it has a good flavor to it, and I would recommend it to anybody who want to give it a try. A little smoke on the end. You like what, it? what did we drink last week? Buffalo Bill? Buffalo Trace. Buffalo Trace. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like, that was a bourbon, right? Yes, it's bourbon. I like that better. Yeah. Not that I won't drink every last drop of this. Yeah. But right. I like that yeah, one a little better. I guess, here, huh? I guess, yeah, I guess, <laughs> no. <laughs> I guess I'm not a, I'm not as much a scotch guy. This is a good mm -hmm. for like less than 20 bucks. This is a pretty decent, you know, scotch. Got a little smoke on the end. It's a blend. It's right. not the, the greatest thing that you ever tasted, but. A good uh, everyday drinker. Not bad, not bad. Monarch. This is an alcoholic. I just wonder, like, drink, is that what you're saying? In, the royal, in the royal line, where does Monarch of the Glen come? I, I mean, a, you have like Viscount, Duke, and all that, but you're like Monarch of the Glen. You rule this like little area of grass. It's one step of above Jester. Right. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, uh, today we are reviewing a book by the '90s television star Paul Reiser called How to Get to Carnegie Hall. First off, before you knew it, did you guys know this joke that the book is based on How to Get to Carnegie Hall? Have you heard that joke before? Yeah. I didn't really understand that it was a joke. I just what? kind of understood it as a proverb. I, I no, knew it. A little bit both, yeah. I, I, just kind of, I just kind of always thought of it as a proverb. So that for those of you not familiar with this, How to Get to Carnegie Hall, you'd ask, like, hey, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer is a whole lot of hard work. So it's like, mm -hmm. I think you got to grow up or, with I've heard the version, practice, practice, practice. Yeah, practice, practice, practice. practice, practice, practice. Because um, the joke would be like you're trying to get there with directions wise and saying how would you get there to be a performer on stage? It's a lot Dunch. Of yeah. Right. Um, I'll be here all week. I'll be, tip your waitress. Uh, so this book is, I think, based upon a, a college commencement speech that Paul Reiser put together for one of his sons. Um, what? I, you know, it's kind of based upon this old proverb slash joke. What did you guys think of this book? Uh, <coughs> and, uh, it's kind of a collection of short stories. We've been doing a lot of that lately. But what, what do you guys think? I thought it was a collection of the same story over and over. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was just, you know, it was just like one would have like, uh, he talked about how he met this great and wonderful and giving and generous comedian, mm -hmm. Rob Reiner, who helped him to understand about the delivery of, you know, comic uh timing and you know the rest of that and then the next one was about carol burnett who was this giving and generous and kind classic comedian uh -huh. who would teach him about how to deliver a joke and then the next, the next one, one was about bill cosby was this kind right and generous right rapist right. Who right. Wait, yes that hasn't been proven yet <laughs> a legend <laughs> right. you know, i didn't really notice it until you brought it up but it was kind of the same story spread out amongst different celebrities right you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I hate this, but... One of the things that's shown through for me, though, kind of on that note, is he seems like a real good guy. He seems like a yeah. gentleman. I, I thought, he, he just seems like a down-to-earth, really good guy who values, I don't know, politeness, good manners, treating people decently. He didn't um, aliens, did he? <laughs> he was an asshole. Yeah, he was. He People were happy. Was he an alien yeah. or alien? No, he was an alien. And he was the corporate, the corporate guy, guy yeah, who got beat up and everybody awesome. was happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right, yeah. right. No, yeah. I did see that. Mm -hmm. I did see that. I, though I did have to go. I did have to look up on IMDb and it took a little, little figuring it out to figure out which movie he was in with Peter Falk. Mm. What wow. movie was it? Okay, now I've already forgotten. Was it like Das Boot or something? No, no, it was, it was like, it was some family drama. It was, it was not a good movie. Like I was ABC a, TV family, ABC family TV. I, was, I think it was in 2005, maybe. Okay. But I was surprised that he gave so much ink to such a crappy movie that was not well received right. at all. Yeah, the message was Peter Falk was a kind and gentle and giving kind of actor who wasn't a comedian, mm -hmm. but he was generous with sharing his knowledge with people and how he freaked out 
arguing with the director of photography. No, I was totally the, into the, into that though. I was like, that that does make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. You know, so okay, so one of the things he talks about, not that he, he says that like, you know, not that I'm trying to justify um, the the sort of temper tantrums that um, prima donna movie stars throw, but a lot of the times. It's about the fact that they care so much about their craft and they don't see, they don't understand how to get their viewpoint or they feel like they're not being heard um, with the director or, you know, the producer or studio executives that, you know, they just kind of have this meltdown, but it's because they, they, they care so damn much. And, you know, he talked about the story of Peter Falk. That's what Peter Falk said, you know, I just, I just want to see that this is done right. I thought, yeah, that, that actually kind of makes sense. Yeah. Right. No, it, it does. You know, um, it's just like he, he had it pissed off and flipped over the table or something because he had to get the point across. Oh, as soon as something. he said that, I was like, I'm looking forward to doing that one. I'm 75. I'm going to get pissed <laughs> off at Thanksgiving and flip it over as he was like, <coughs> Look at you. <laughs> Cut him off. I already knew it. <laughs> right. You don't spill my Actually, I am a Scotch man. <laughs> right. You know, one of the one of the things I love about um, comedians that have kind of come come into the later part of their career as actors is how much crap they have to go to to get to where they are. I think there's mm-hmm. you don't really see that in other professions because you know comedians you got hecklers you got to do a lot of uh, a lot of open mics. There's a, there's a okay, long side note. Road. Yeah, we got Google or, or look up on YouTube mm-hmm. um, something about what well, would be the right phrase. Something about like um, like stand up comedian handles heckler or heckler mm-hmm. versus you know insert your favorite comedian here you know you can look at Kevin Hart mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. probably Paul Reisner or Bill Cosby um, these guys do this every single day yeah. day in day out so when they're at the top of their game you know a heckler shows up and that, that's the right. one time you have a hecklers they usually get handled. And just, right, yeah. they usually just get made a complete ass of. So right. there, there's a little side note. Mm-hmm. Um, so you see what Bill Cosby did recently. So a lady was getting up to like go use the bathroom, and he was just like, "You better not leave your drink alone." <laughs> yeah, I was, I, like, that. yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Really? Do you, do you really want to say that?" He but did it, that. Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you went there. So, but but I think there's something you said from coming from that background. You no, know, it's. Um, I think all of us face rejection of some sort, and mm-hmm. whatever career you have, you will hit a small degree of that. But to, to be a comedian, you're on stage in front of a bunch of people that may not even want to be there. I, me and my wife went to an open mic night once, we were, we were at a coffee house and they were doing it, mm-hmm. and uh, I had anxiety for the comedians. I was watching this because it was bad, it was like a, they, they each got five minutes, and um, most of them had about a minute and a half worth of material. <laughs> And to watch him get up and just flail around on stage and not have a good experience um, and nobody laugh. That's the, the other right. thing on top of this. To hear an empty room full of people like... <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, it just crickets. I'm just yeah. there for the mochas. <laughs> I don't know. Mocha. Well, what kind of club are you going to? Oh, it was, I thought it was a coffee. Coffee. It was coffee. Oh, it was a coffee house. Yeah, so, but oh. the funny thing was, well, I think besides me and my wife, there was... There was Not maybe ours. two other people that weren't comedians. It was all comedians that were there to see, to just get their five minutes on stage. Mm-hmm. And uh, I feel like if you can get through that, um, your odds of succeeding in other areas are pretty damn good. If you right. can get through a bunch of people saying, mm, your work's no good, you're not funny, and just keep, keep going, keep going, keep going, mm-hmm. that spills over into a lasting career. Right. Um, and I, you know, it's funny that the Carnegie Hall joke this is based off of. Uh, I've never heard that because I don't know that that that's on the forefront of people's minds anymore. I don't mm-hmm. think practice, practice, practice is being taught. I think, you know, how to get to Carnegie Hall? Um, get a reality TV show. Make well, a complete exactly. ass of yourself. <laughs> right. Well, you, you, know douche, what? you know all this. Right. Things. I have a friend of mine who's a singer, and he does a lot of background stuff. And he told me years ago what it is is that. Music companies now pay attention to people they know will be one hit wonders mm-hmm. because they have to put they can put minimal investment into them and make maximum return on that yeah. investment. So they don't try to nurture mm-hmm. all of these artists as they come on like they used to. Yeah. You know, and it's kinda sad because that's why we have, you know, like just I think a lot of the crappy stuff that we have to listen to and the stuff that we have to deal with. Mm-hmm. 
You know, just like the other night, like Beck won uh, album of the <laughs> year. Yeah, about that. yeah, and then the you know, dumbass Kanye West was about to rush the stage. Fake rapping. Right, and then somebody <laughs> saw the whole, yeah, yeah, everybody's comment come on, no, you know, was Kanye com- really about to rush the stage? Yeah, he, he went up there like he right. snatched out of Beck's hand. Like right. he, he did was to, to Taylor Swift? Yeah, yeah, he was about exactly. to do that, and he was doing it. In what stopped him? Uh, I did not watch the Grammys. What stopped him? He just smiled and backed off for some reason. Yeah. Oh, that would have been wonderful. Right. He was close. I, he was very close. Right. But, you know, it's just like, guys, like him, people talk about, oh, he's a musical genius, this, that, and the other. Well, you're taking a bunch of other people's music, sampling it, mm-hmm. and putting it together, and then rapping a whole bunch of bad lyrics over the top that don't make any sense to anybody but you. And people are calling this genius. You know, you're stealing your ideas. Okay. You know, the, 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 what was the song that won Song of the Year? It was, um, uh, was Sam Smith. Oh, Stay With, with me? me? Stay With Me. I'd never heard it before. I listened to it and I was like, that's not a new song. The chorus, note for note, mm-hmm. is Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. He actually admitted to that. Yeah. He right. stole that, so, that riff. Yeah. I had never heard it, but I listened to it because my wife was like, oh, here's the, here's the song of the year. Mm-hmm. And I listened to it and I was like, stand my ground. Right. But, but, but you know, yeah. I, I heard that in my head and I, and, and, I, and I shared it with a couple of friends and everybody, I was like, what song does this remind you of? And everybody mm-hmm. that I shared it with got it. So no. was it like a bunch of angry white people saying, but he's white, so I guess. Yeah, he's cool. white. We're, we're, sometimes we get angry with, with our kind. I mean. Right, yeah, because, you know, black people always <laughs> stole music from white people. Yeah. You know, they had know. to set down their Earl Grey tea to hold on that whole discussion. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they threw a Triscuit and that was... <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about? Is there a book in this discussion? <laughs> so, but I think that... We're talking about practice and all practice. that kind of stuff and how people don't do it or have to mm-hmm. anymore. Yeah, and I, I think that that's kind of vanished from our culture. Is that you know the easiest way to be famous is to find some some really good shortcut, get mm-hmm. your two minutes of fame on YouTube, which right. maybe could happen for this show. And that's what we're saying. doing right now. <laughs> exactly. uh, but I, but I also which, know, please kind of, watch, please subscribe, please subscribe, please. show your friends. But I, but I also <laughs> know, even along with this show, is that um, you know I don't expect our show to be on the top of YouTube tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I know that we're probably well, going to have to do I a couple do, of shitty so. seasons. Oh, right. you know, I mean, I don't hey, understand. Melanie! My wife's here. Come say hi. Come here. here. Make a cameo, Mel. Yeah. My, my wife's here. She might come say hi. Maybe not. Melanie? No, she don't. Not going to happen. Um, <laughs> but that's something that, to look forward to. Next yeah. episode, she might come mm-hmm. make an appearance. But I, I think that that's kind of vanished in terms of, uh, you know, just... There's no expectation that the only way to get to the top of your game is to work your ass off. I, I don't, mm-hmm. and I think comics the only one where there's not really any shortcut. Yeah. Right. Okay. So can I recommend another biography? Yeah. Steve Martin's autobiography. That that mm-hmm. uh, it's probably just called Steve Martin or something. Isn't it? But, uh, Born standing up. Is that what? Born it? standing up. It's got the little rabbit ears on the cover. Okay. Yeah. So on this one, mm-hmm. I recommend you listen to the audiobook because Steve Martin does it. Mm-hmm. So you actually get his intonation and, and, and there's a lot of emotion in it. Mm-hmm. And he talks about those brutal years where you know there's there is no shortcut. Mm-hmm. There's no reality TV show to go through. Um, he has to play to one person in a coffee shop that does not like him and is heckling him. Right. You know, that's the funny thing is like when you go to Vegas, it's like you get these guys who have to play, you know, the Lido Lounge at 3 Mm a.m. And there's like the one guy there, or even if nobody's there, they have to stand up and do their act in case somebody Somebody shows up, up, you know. And I I, I don't think I could live like that, that's just such a hard But you existence. know, that's also, and I think we've talked about, we've referenced this before, mm-hmm. um, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. He yeah. talks about the Beatles um, yeah, getting their right. 10,000 hours playing in Hamburg. They mm-hmm. literally played in a strip club where, let's be honest, nobody goes to a strip club to listen to the band. What? <laughs> no, yeah. Right, no, right, they, right. they don't go to discover new no, talent. I have a good story for you when you do but, that. <laughs> okay. oh. but, but they played for 10 hours a day seven days a week and they just got really really good getting through the grind at strip clubs mm-hmm. what's your good story yeah, right. i can't wait to hear wow, this. What's this? Uh, I can't wait. So, back in my younger days in my mm-hmm. reckless youth i uh you used to listen to the beatles no know. shut your mouth <laughs> um i do listen to the beatles but what happened i used to work at this factory and the factory was across the street from the strip joint mm-hmm. during the daylight hours all the non-good looking women would 
do their routines. I mean, they had like one good looking girl. Well, that's the team. That, yeah, it that's was like, where oh, cut their teeth. With this was oh, somebody should have cut them. But <laughs> wait, I, was it just ugly women or the women who didn't understand the no, the no, art they were dancing? no, they they were horrible. Okay, you know, it was just like you see those clubs where we have hundreds of beautiful women and three ugly mm-hmm. ones. The day shift was the three ugly ones. <laughs> And they had like one good looking chick named Piper, but I don't know why I remember her. That name. was a real name, right? I don't know. Piper, we're dedicating this show to you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where remember you, are. Piper? You're probably about 60 years old now. <laughs> um, but anyway, my point was this is that they had this delicious buffet that everybody <laughs> would go and eat at, and we actually went there for the food <laughs> because the women there were so. Idiots. You know, so one of my former business partners, he tried to convince me that we should institute a Friday buffet <laughs> at a strip club. And he's like, what? The food. It's for the food. It's good. It's, it's delicious. Right. Exactly. And I was like, no, we're and not going to do right. that. And, but I can attest to you that actually works. People would come in, and unless Piper was on stage, nobody paid attention. There was <laughs> one woman who was there. She would dance in like some ugly, like, nighty. And she was. Can you can you demonstrate? For no. Us? What, what did she and, do? No. Exactly? And she would play <laughs> classical music during her sets, so people were definitely ignoring her. Wow. You're, but, you're joking? No, no, no I'm joking. serious. I'm dead serious. <laughs> I'm dead. It would be like Mozart, Bach, and people would just turn around and go back to what they were doing. Oh, in the evening. Back to shrimp cocktail. Exactly. <laughs> um, let me. Let me bring this in. I uh, I would tell you. Um, There's no way to wrap this up. Don't now. don't read this book. And uh, the reason why is it's it, it's not that it's awful. It's just I think you can get the information from other places in a better format. Um, I will recommend instead. There's a book by Cal Newport called "So Good They Can't Ignore You," which is a quote from Steve Martin's book. Because mm-hmm. um, they asked him, "How can you be, you know, so good? What what will, what will people see in you that they'll want it to?" to have you come do a work for them or whatever else. And he said, be so good they can't ignore you. And I think that's something, that's how you get to Carnegie Hall. Be so damn good, work so hard that no one, you know, they, they can't ignore how much work you put in. Um, and if you want, if you need some help in that direction, go go to open mic night and, uh, and feel that, that pain. Um, or maybe go on buffet night. Whatever, whatever's your, <laughs> you know, what, what did you think? Would you recommend this book? I would recommend it okay. just because I think there's so few people of good character mm. um, that are writing books and that have a you know a celebrity mm-hmm. platform in our culture. And I think I didn't know this. I, I was the '90s. I was in high school. I was playing sports. I was joining the military. So I I didn't watch Mad About You. So I didn't know who Paul Reisner. Yeah, Paul Reisner quite was. Reiser. Reiser. Yeah. Reiser. Mm-hmm. Not Reisner. No. Paul Reiser. Reiser. Okay, I didn't know who Paul Reiser was. Mm -hmm. Um, So, (coughs) I really appreciate the fact that he just, he seems to be a person of excellent character, which you don't see a lot in Hollywood in in hit shows. Mm -hmm. So, I I think it's worth reading just to, I don't know, it's good to hear the words of somebody of good character. Yeah, what do you think? Hell no, I wouldn't recommend this book. (laughs) You know, I mean, he has good character and I think he's a nice guy, but... Like I said, it's the same story over and over. If I was reading it on the toilet, I'd finish my business and get up. I wouldn't even spend any extended amount of time. You know, that's what men do. You know, we sit there, we read it, and you know, it's like, oh, okay, I'll just sit here for a minute. No, I'm done. I gotta go. I gotta go watch the paint dry or something like that. You want good advice? Go talk to your parents. Don't read Paul Reiser's book. You know, that's just my opinion. On that note, thanks for watching, guys. We'll be back very soon with more great books.